Okay, um, uh, I'm going to talk about sampling. My name is Ben Limepooler, and uh, I work in Edinburgh University in applied mathematics. Um, most of the time I work on problems that are more related to, you know, molecular simulation, molecular modeling. But lately I've been doing, you know, increasing work in the area of data science because it turns out that many of the algorithms and ideas carry over in, into that field. So uh, despite what uh, Gazine said, um, I don't intend to, uh, to give a very heavy duty mathematics uh, lecture. I'm going to give an introductory talk and uh, I'm going to give a lot of references and uh, you know, I'm going to be around this week so if anybody wants to ask me questions uh, you should feel free. Um, so uh, the basic problem I'm going to address is this problem of uh, stochastic sampling which I think of as integration and uh, so you know that looks very simple then and we can all go home right because we know how to integrate functions. Um, so here uh, phi is the observable function, and uh, uh, this d mu is typically described as a Gibbs measure. Actually, it's just any probability measure that we can normalize. So uh, it's uh, written as uh, exponential of minus u dq. The density is uh, exponential of minus u, but u is some sort of arbitrary function. So we can think of it as an energy function if we're doing physics, and we can think of it as a uh, uh, you know, a, a likelihood function in the case of statistics. Okay, so here, uh, first of all, they have a little FAQ. Uh, so these are the frequently asked questions, maybe, or some of them. Um, so who is uh, Gibbs? I mentioned Gibbs already. Uh, so who's this Gibbs dude? Uh, what sort of observables are allowed? And uh, why not just integrate directly? Okay, so these are sort of obvious things you might ask when you first see this. Of course, you might ask other things. Um, so who is Gibbs? Gibbs was the father of mathematical statistical mechanics. Uh, actually, Boltzmann is often credited with this, but I think that you know, Gibbs took it to the point of a mathematical theory. And uh, so uh, I think a lot of uh, the ideas from statistical mechanics carry over very well into the molecular sphere, into, into, the, into the data science sphere, and into statistics problems. And they give us ways of handling large dimensional systems. So Gibbs was particularly interested in uh, the statistics of molecules, but uh, you can apply some of the same ideas for data science. Now, what sort of observables are allowed? Well, really, you can have anything you want. And uh, also, you could ask, uh, what about the function u? Well, there are going to be some restrictions on that function in order to make that problem sensible, so that you can normalize the integral, for example. Um, in, in most cases, we'll just deal with a smooth function on a bounded domain to keep things uh, relatively easy in terms of presentation. One of the important things is that the, that the density concentrates the measure so that uh, we can talk about you know, doing these calculations um, you know, in, a, in a sensible way, in a practical way. And uh, so that sort of brings the next issue in, which is why not just integrate directly if I have this integral here, why can't I just, uh, my laser pointer is not really working right now, um, but if I have um, this, uh, this integral, why not just calculate it by one of the direct methods or by discretizing, oh yes, use the pointer, good idea, yeah, but it uh, requires two things at once, Jared, it's very complicated. Um, so the, the thing is that we'd like to be able to do very large dimensional problems. So uh, in, in small dimensions, of course, we can use you know, some sort of uh, uh, common quadrature schemes and things, but, uh, but if we're doing large dimensional problems, we can't do that. And large here doesn't have to mean large like mathematicians usually mean it, six or eight. It could mean a billion. Uh, so where are the applications? Well, I've already sort of mentioned that. Uh, the most you know, sort of prevalent applications until recently, we're really in chemistry and physics, but increasingly, these problems are arising in statistics. And a lot of statistical calculation is about sampling. Okay, so how do we get a statistics problem? We're really not going to have much about the application side in statistics, but luckily we had an introduction in the previous talk. Um, I call this the likelihood machine. So I have 
you know, data, let's say X1, X2, and so on, X, capital X is my data set, and I describe it, uh, by, I want to describe it by some sort of a, a distribution function. Maybe I know a functional form for that involving some parameters. So the parameters written here, Q, Q1, Q2, up to QD, and I have some sort of prior distribution, let's say I know something about the parameters, all right? I have some way of localizing them. And then I can define a likelihood function, which is uh, the, the, the likelihood of uh, the data given certain parameter values. But if I'm trying to find optimal parameters, I actually need something else. I need to know if I'm looking at certain data, you know, uh, what are the best parameter values? That's sort of the opposite question. And uh, so, uh, luckily, there's a way to turn this around. Uh, thanks to Bayes, Thomas Bayes, we can, in Bayes' theorem, we can, uh, we can write a formula for the, for the probability distribution of the parameters given the data. <clears throat> and I've, writ I've written it here in the form of an exponential to match you know, my, my concept for Gibbs sampling. Um, so, u of q here is the log likelihood function. And I've uh, just got a note down here. Well, first of all, I should point out that Thomas Bayes is actually a University of Edinburgh graduate. Uh, so that's kind of a nice uh, thing to, to have uh, as one of your alumnus. Um, from uh, 1721, and I've actually seen his name signed on the student roll. But here's another thing. You're going to see this picture all over the place of Thomas Bayes. And I was reading a uh, biography, and uh, it turns out that very likely, that is not Thomas Bayes. This, this, this picture got picked up at some point. Um, we don't have any other picture of Thomas Bayes. That's the only one. And uh, it, people just attached that to him. But the, the, the link is a bit tenuous. And one biographer said he openly questioned that this could possibly be a picture of Thomas Bayes. So it may not actually be him. Okay, but I think he has to be Thomas Bayes because we need a picture of a person to go with this wonderful theorem. So uh, from now on, you know, forever, this man, whoever he is, is Thomas Bayes. <laughs> um, so here's an example of a, of a problem that you might run into. Maybe you won't. Uh, if you happen to be a, a, an avid stamp collector, I think you run into problems like this. An avid stamp collector with a with a you know bent for studying stamps with mathematical statistics, so it's maybe a little bit small set, but anyway, um, there's a, a data set floating around that that describes the, uh, the the thicknesses of stamps, 485 stamps from Mexico in 1872, and apparently these stamps were like produced in different factories, so their thicknesses are slightly different, the construction is slightly different, so the features are slightly different, and it, it turns out that you can describe this kind of a, a situation where you have, say, three factories, you could describe it by a, uh, a Gaussian mixture model with three components. And uh, so this is what, what I've written down here. So people actually have, have used this model to study this, this set of stamps. Uh, it's just a toy model, uh, but it sort of illustrates the idea. And, uh, you know, one of the features of this distribution function, this is just looking at some cross-section here of the distribution, um, is that you get this elongation in the basins. That turns out to be a really important thing for, you know, it tends to slow down sampling algorithms. So this is something we like to deal with. Um, it's also multimodal in the sense you've got lots of, lots of ocean between the peaks and the distribution. So you sort of uh, have, to, have to find your way through low probability regions to reach the, the high probability zones. If you start in one basin, you have to traverse this, you know, maybe large dimensional space here, it's just got eight parameters after we normalize, um, you, you know, you have to traverse that, that space, and that may be very challenging to find methods that can actually bridge up the different zones. Uh, to make a little bit more straightforward example, you can look at the uneven double well, which is already a really good model for many problems uh, that, that arise in, in sampling. Uh, you can play with this one. This is just a toy with some parameters in it that allow you to adjust the shape. So this is this would be the U function. So it's a little bit of an abstract toy, but it's it's actually very useful to use this uh, this model. And the first thing you should do probably if you have a new sampling method is say, how is it going to work on the uneven double well? And then 
you know, go on to more complicated things. Um, okay, so the first uh, thing I'm going to talk about is a few types of sampling methods. And, uh, you know, uh, most schemes uh, for sampling are going to generate a sequence like this. So you're sort of turning that high-dimensional integration problem into a one-dimensional path problem. And that's one of the things you can do if you have a very concentrated distribution. So, um, so this is a sort of schematic of that. If this is the distribution here, this is a path that is sampling the distribution, travels around, uh, visiting the regions of high probability. So the question is, you know, how do we generate this sequence in such a way that you're guaranteed to converge? Um, so that means that when we calculate an average along one of these paths, we eventually get the average of the, uh, that we're interested in. The integration, we solve the integration problem this way. I mean, we would also be interested in how rapidly such methods converge. Okay, so this is the sort of prototypical method um, of this class, which is the Monte Carlo method. And uh, this is actually, I thought I should put a little Python code in here so that you guys can um, try things out yourselves because actually. You know, especially as it gets more complicated, if you want to understand the algorithms, you really need to test them. You need to program them and run them. And, you know, not just with double wells, with other things as well. But you do need to run simulations, trying to get an understanding just by, you know, looking at some mathematical theory. Well, it might give you some understanding of the mathematical theory, but it won't help you to develop new algorithms. Um, so this is, a, this is a method for calculating pi. All you do is you throw down uh, uniform random numbers in the, in the square, and then you accept or reject, depending on whether or not they landed in the circle. And all you're calculating here is pi, okay? So this is, you know, a simple, a very simple form of that integration problem. It's extremely easy to program, and it converges rigorously to the right to value. And in fact, you could look at the, this is just a way of calculating how it converges, okay? So, um, so you, can, you can look at the accuracy uh, as you take more and more samples. And uh, if, you, if you look at this for large steps, you can see it's eventually going to zero, but you can also see it's going to zero rather slowly. You know, we haven't reached it after 10,000 steps. Uh, we haven't gotten even close, right? And in fact, slowing down. This is what, what happens is that the rate of convergence is like one over the square root of n. You know, it's very, very slow. So that's a problem. It's almost a fundamental problem in these kinds of methods. But uh, why do we put up with that? Because, um, you know, we need to somehow solve these very large dimensional integration problems. And this is one of the tools that can actually do it. Now, what we're going to see is some other methods now that are more sophisticated and which, uh, which can improve the convergence, uh, you know, in, in calculating integrals and in more general settings. Um, but they still typically do face these kinds of barriers, like a one over square root of n somewhere in there. Um, the difference is that we might be able to get the constant down by using some very sophisticated method. Okay, so one way to generalize the, uh, the Monte Carlo method that I just described is to use the Metropolis-Hastings Monte Carlo method. And, you know, it sort of recognizes that just throwing down uniform random numbers might not be the way to go. We might want to do something a bit more sophisticated. For example, we might want to sample from one distribution and then correct. Okay, so the, the idea here is that we can incorporate what's called a prior distribution to help localize the steps and to choose good steps. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we can use that to accelerate and, and generalize the sampling procedure. So the general idea here is to generate a random move and then accept or reject depending on uh, a metropolis test. And here random is just in quotes because, you know, it could be any sampling, any random variable. We can do that any way we want. Um, but of course, you know, we have to make this thing practical. So there's going to be some implementation restrictions. And then, uh, you know, when we've uh, obtained some samples, we can use it to calculate an average. Okay, so this is the framework of Metropolis-Hastings uh, Monte Carlo. 
uh, we have a, a target density rho. Okay, so this is the thing we'd like to sample. Um, and we have a, uh, a function f, which doesn't have to be rho itself. It could be, but you actually just need something proportional to rho. And that turns out to be important because sometimes it's difficult to know, you know a normalization constant for the distribution. And one of the things that you get with the metropolis hastings is you only need to calculate a ratio. So uh, you'll, you can actually use something that's proportional to rho. And then we have a proposal distribution, which is this uh, G of, of Q given Q prime, and we assume it's symmetric here. Okay, so the idea is that you, you uh, start from Qn and you draw from the proposal distribution a Q. So this is the Qn tilde that appears here. And then you calculate um, the value of f, which is proportional to the density, the target density. And if it's, uh, if it's bigger than the previous value, you say, oh, I've, I've gone down, right? And I mean, I've gone up in terms of the, of the uh, likelihood, right? So this is, a, this is a good sample, and you accept it, okay? So that becomes the next sample from this algorithm. So you write qn plus 1 gets qn tilde. Um, Otherwise, you, uh, you compute the ratio, so this is f of qn tilde over f of qn, and then you use that to calculate, uh, to perform this, this test. So this is a uniform random variable, and what that's doing is implementing an, a correction uh, that allows you to accept some samples that otherwise, you know, they don't necessarily go down in terms of uh, energy or go up in terms of distribution, but uh, they still um, would be reasonable sam samples from the distribution that you're targeting. And so in this case, uh, you know, you would, you would uh, reject in case u, the uniform random variable that you draw is less than this, this ratio, lambda. And uh, then you set qn plus 1 to be qn, and you continue. Okay, so it's a really simple iterative procedure. Also, again, very easy to implement. And, uh, and so you can, you can use that to sample more general distributions and with more general proposals, right? So this is, this is fairly versatile. Now, in terms of convergence, okay, um, you can show, and this is really, this is a bit technical, so I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details of this. This is something you need to know a bit of probability theory to understand. Um, but uh, the metropolis hastings uh, Monte Carlo method defines a Markov chain with this transition density. So this is the general class of, of iterations that we're talking about here, these stochastic iterations. G is the proposal distribution, and A is the acceptance uh, distribution, which is you know, defined in this way. Okay, So this is just a corresponding to what we had on the previous slide, in fact. And uh, you can check um, detailed balance for this, uh, this uh, transition density. So uh, for your target distribution, um, you know, you just need to have this, this, this uh, criterion satisfied. It will be uh, for the method that I described. Uh, so that's a sufficient but not necessary condition. There are other ways to achieve that, but this is the easiest way. Now, uh, in terms of convergence, that starts to get a little bit complicated to prove convergence of the metropolis ac method. Um, so what you really need to show is not just the stationarity, but also the, the ergodicity property. You need to show that you know, there's a unique uh, stationary state, and you, you approach that state asymptotically. Um, so in other words, your distribution converges to the target. And uh, for a finite state Markov chain, it's actually relatively easy to write down a full analysis. Um, you know, you can do that with a fairly basic linear algebra. Uh, when you want to do it for continuous distributions, it gets a bit more involved. And so there's a whole theory for that, um, something called Harris chains. There's no way I'm going to go through it, but there's a, there's a book on this subject by mine and Tweedy, and this is really a standard reference if you want to understand about uh, convergence of, of Monte Carlo methods. So you know, that would be a a good place to start doing some reading. And I should mention that in addition to the method that I've described, there are other methods. Uh, one in particular that's very popular in data science is Gibbs sampling. And in Gibbs sampling, you sort of uh, hold uh, most of your variables or all of your variables except one 
uh, constant and then resample. So it makes a kind of scalar process, which is, uh, which is nice in terms of being able to implement the steps. But it can be very inefficient, too. And I would say that there are many cases where uh, Gibbs sampling is not the, uh, the, the, the method of choice. It's just a simple one to implement. Okay, so just to see an example, this is a code for, a, for the uneven double well. And uh, this is the kind of behavior that you'll see. So this is our uneven double well. And, uh, and this is a simulation. And what you, you, know, what you have is this, the samples are starting down here, and then they move around. And so you see that here, this is the x the position here uh, with the step number. So we, we stay in, the, in this basin for a long time. And then we have a transition to the other basin. And then we have a transition back and a transition. Transition back, we stay for a while, we transition and so on. Now, eventually, this will sample the distribution corresponding to this potential. So you can just, you know, you write the density functions just e to the minus u for this u. And you can draw that, that's the red curve here, and the histogram is shown here on top of it. Of course, in this case, we can, we can write everything out. We, you know, we know exactly how to plot that and we can compare. But um, in the general case, you have to look at some, you know, some way of, of localizing that because you're talking about high dimensions. But what you can see in this example is that the, there's just way too much measure in the right basin in this simulation. This was 100,000 steps. If I do a million steps, that will come down, but it'll still be slow to converge the, the distribution to the correct one, in particular for the, because of this rare event that happens here, this slow process that's happening of going back and forth between the two basins. That's only happening occasionally. So in a way, we're wasting a lot of time sampling something that's fairly simple, and then we're occasionally sampling what we're interested in, which is the transitions between. So the method will work, but it might be a slow converging. Um, one way to, to quantify that is, is to use something called the integrated autocorrelation time. And what that says is how rapidly a particular observable decorrelates. <coughs> um, so you can calculate this. It's a fairly easy thing to calculate, although um, in practice, there's a little bit involved in that. Unfortunately, there is a nice code by uh, Jonathan Goodman, um, the ACOR package, and there's a, I found a Python uh, translation of that. So if you like Python, you can use that. Um, and that's a, that really, you don't need to know anything except your data. You put it in and say, what's my, my, my integrated autocorrelation time? And it calculates it for you and gives you a number back. So you don't have to think much about the implementation of this calculation. And there are a few tricks in that. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's a way to quantify conversions. Now I'm going to talk about something I realize is a little bit embarrassing for me because the inventor of this method is sitting right back there um, in the midst of you, um, Tony Kennedy. But, uh, but this is a, a very nice, um, you know, add-on to the Metropolis uh, Hastings uh, Monte Carlo framework. Um, so this is something called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and um, it's very popular for sampling, also in data science. Um, and the idea here is to use a Hamiltonian system solved by a suitable numerical method to define a proposal distribution, and then uh, combine that with the Metropolis-Hastings test. So in, in hybrid Monte Carlo, the goal is, is still to sample the distribution I've been talking about, the Gibbs distribution this one here. But the way that it achieves this is to introduce a, an artificial variable, which you can think of as being, you know, analogous to a momentum in a physical system. So you have momentum and position variables. And, uh, you know, then there's a way to discuss the dynamics of this, um, this combined system in terms of, you know, constant energy dynamics. And we use that to actually generate the proposal. Now, why is that uh, okay, in a sense? Well, if you look at this, uh, this density here, if I integrate it out with respect to the momenta, that means sort of averaging out over all the momenta, I would get the distribution that I'm interested in up to a constant scaling. 
So it's fine to embed the problem in this way into a larger dimensional space. Now, the, the idea in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is to combine these two steps in order to make an algorithm. So the first step is a refreshment in which the momenta are drawn or perhaps partially drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So what I mean by partially is you might mix the uh, momentum with the previous momentum. And people sometimes do that because they're interested in maintaining correlations. Um, we'll come to correlation in the, in the dynamics later. And then, uh, and then the idea is to add a Hamiltonian numerical trajectory phase. So you simulate the Hamiltonian system. That means you just simulate the constant energy dynamics of that system with positions and momenta. So you treat it like a physical model. Okay, and you, you let the, the particle, which might be parameter values, move around with the momentum variable and explore a little bit. And then you uh, accept or reject the result of that, of that excursion uh, using the metropolis Hastings technique. So it's really quite straightforward. As a procedure, there are a couple of steps in there, obviously, that need to be discussed, in particular, this, this Hamiltonian system solve. Um, an important aspect is that the, the step uh, of computing these Hamiltonian numerical trajectories has to be time reversible and volume preserving to give us detailed balance. So this is the easy way to get convergence of the method. Uh, so for Hamiltonian system, that's the Hamiltonian system. So these are the, you know, this is the usual way that we describe physical systems at constant energy. We have some differential equations that involve our positions, and these could be the coordinates, and the momenta, the p's, which correspond to those. So we have one if we had a, a system with many uh, you know, parameters, we would have momentum for each parameter. And, uh, and then uh, you can easily see that if I have a system that's described in this way, I take the derivative with respect to time of the Hamiltonian function, the energy function, which is p squared over 2 plus u of q. If I differentiate that with re respect to, to time, I get, uh, by chain rule, the partial of h with respect to q times q dot plus the partial of h with respect to p times p dot, and that's zero, right, by construction, the way this is set up. So in the, in the usual case, this is like Newton's equations of motion. Okay? It's the most basic way of, of describing the dynamics of a constant energy system. So how does it work when we do a harmonic oscillator? That's always the toy model, the go-to toy model for, for understanding anything in physics. Um, so you start with this Hamiltonian, p squared over 2 plus q squared over 2. That's the harmonic oscillator. The potential energy function here, the u of q, is just this, this simple parabola. And these are the equations of motion. They're linear in this case. And we know that the motion is circular motion. Okay, so this is just a very simple problem. The motion leaves the energy invariant, so it also leaves this density function invariant. Right? If I change, you know, p by moving along one of the trajectories of this system, I don't change the energy value and I don't change the distribution. But uh, if I now resample P from a normal distribution, so a Gaussian distribution, um, well, that'll also leave this, this distribution invariant in the distributional sense, okay? So in the sense of probability distribution. So this is a, this is a way of, of modifying the momenta and maintaining the distribution. And um, so if you think about what's actually happening, we move along these, these circles, which represent you know, circular arcs, which represent the uh, solution of the Hamiltonian dynamics. And then we, we resample the momenta and move along a circular arc. And it's sort of obvious that in the momentum direction, if we look at just the, the p values, we're going to maintain the, uh, the, the distribution, this part of the distribution, e to the minus p squared over 2, a Gaussian distribution, if we've sampled them from a Gaussian distribution, even taking the Hamiltonian motion into, into consideration. But what we all also automatically get is the correct sampling in the q direction. Okay, so this is a nice thing about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It gives you a way to, to, to 
get the distribution of Q from something you really know, which is that Gaussian distribution for the momentum. In more general cases, the U will be much more complicated, but you can still use this technique to get the right distribution function. So that's kind of, you know, a cool idea. The only place where you really need to do the sampling is in the P. And then everything else comes from the magic of the Metropolis-Hastings technique. So this is the way to think about HMC. It's mixing around within a given energy level using Hamiltonian dynamics together with randomizing momenta to mix between different energy levels. This is really what it's about. Now, in order to make that method work for more complicated problems, we have an immediate difficulty. Okay, so if you look at this, we were able to solve here for the Hamiltonian paths. So we could calculate those trajectories, right, exactly. But in general, we won't be able to do that. So we have to use a numerical method. And the kind of methods that you need to use here are symplectic numerical methods. Actually, you have more freedom than that. You have to use a volume preserving and time reversible method. But uh, in practice, the easiest way to get a volume preserving method is to use a symplectic method. Symplectic methods are automatically volume preserving. So this is obviously a complicated concept. It's something from mathematical physics. It's, uh, it's the foundation for you know, all sorts of properties of, of, say, gravitational systems or for quantum mechanics. It's uh, fundamental in physics. But it's, we have relatively simple ways to build these symplectic integrators, so you don't have to worry about all the, uh, you know, the physical issues that underpin this. So in particular, here is a simple symplectic integrator. If you take this Hamiltonian, which has a P part and a Q part separated in this way, as they are in the, you know, HMC framework that I described, um, then I, I look at just this piece and I, th I ignore the Q part. And I get these equations of motion. So this is q dot equal m inverse p with p dot equals zero. And if I take the u part, I get these equations. If I add together the right-hand sides, I get the, the full Newtonian dynamic system. So what I've done is to break up the vector field, the right-hand side of the differential equation, into pieces by additive splitting. And now it turns out that I can integrate or solve each of these pieces and by composing the, the solutions to those parts, I get a map, which is a symplectic map, because each of these is a symplectic map generated from solving these individual systems, because in each case we have a Hamiltonian. So in this way, I can build a symplectic numerical method. And you can see this one is quite simple, in, in fact. You can program it just as easily as it's written down here. So this is just a, a sequence of, of simple calculations in order to update the steps. So there's nothing particularly fancy about the symplectic numerical methods, you know, in practice. They're just numerical methods that we can easily program and use. Um, there is a slight issue with symplectic methods, that they don't actually preserve the energy. And when I did that little drawing for the harmonic oscillator, we stayed on those curves, right, on those orbits. And, and that's kind of built into the philosophy of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method, or Hyper Monte Carlo method. Those are two names for the same thing. Um, so we have a problem. They, they, the symplectic methods preserve volume, but they distort the energy. Now, fortunately, there's some theories for how they distort the energy, and they tend to distort the energy relatively modestly. And we actually have a way to analyze the distortion. So I have a couple of pictures just to show you, uh, first of all, the, what the volume preservation property looks like. This is for some little bit more complicated oscillator. And you can see, you know, you start from these initial conditions in this, this is a disk, it's just flattened a bit by perspective here. And you can see how it evolves forward as they get lighter, we're going further in time. And you can see they stretch out, right? These, these, the, the, the points corresponding to the, the trajectory started from these points in this disk. And you, they get, in fact, very elongated here, right? So they become complicated, but their volume stays the same. So, you know, that's, a, that's the property of being symplectic. 
Um, now, what, is, what do we mean by this approximately conserving energy? Well, this is a, just a, an <coughs> illustration. If I have my exact solution here for some Hamiltonian system and I use a symplectic method, what I will typically get for these, this kind of a one-dimensional problem, that means one degree of freedom problem, uh, so one Q and one P, okay, um, is a distorted ellipse. Okay, I get a, 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 a twisted ellipse. And it may be stretched as well. And in fact, uh, for the leapfrog method, uh, this is a picture for a small step size here. So you get a circle, right? It looks close to a circle. It's not exactly a circle. If you use a larger step size, you get points that are actually along an ellipse that has just been squashed. The circle has been squashed down. So those are the, uh, the sort of properties of symplectic methods that allow you to use these to do uh, calculations in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods. Okay, so um, that's a that's a, a framework for doing a lot of calculation, but it's not the only way. And it turns out that you can build more general families of methods that are also very effective. Okay, so there are alternatives to HMC uh, for doing sampling into straight Monte Carlo. Um, so, in general, you could think about any, you know, Markovian iteration procedure. And Markovian just means you, you base the, the next state on the previous state only. So, you know, you just go from step to step. And, you know, you have that for sort of built into the way we described the uh, MCMC methods. But you can do this in a more general setting. You can also consider quasi quasi-Markovian iterations where you have, you know, dependence on previous history, but maybe a finite previous history. Typically, you can realize these uh, as stochastic mappings. So uh, xn gets mapped to xn plus 1 by some function psi, which depends on a parameter of epsilon, and uh, a random variable eta. So we have a randomness coming in. This is a way to think about these Markovian iterations. So epsilon is some sort of control parameter, and you know, in, in a lot of cases, that would be the accuracy of an approximation method. And eta n is just some random sequence generated by a stationary process. Now, in these methods that I'm going to describe, I'm going to give some examples in a second, um, the steps, the subsequent steps are correlated. So they're not completely independent. Uh, they weren't already before in the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method. We started from some point and we integrated a certain amount of time forward. So there was some correlation between the, the, the uh, starting and, 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 uh, and final states of, of the chain. Um, so, you know, each time step will typically be near to, a pre to the previous one. And in most cases, epsilon here will control how near they are. So epsilon is like a step size. So small epsilon means that they're highly correlated. But the other problem that we deal with in these methods is bias. So we tend to get bias in these schemes. And the bias is a function of this parameter epsilon. Yes? I was wondering whether on methods or this equation, is it possible to implement them in parallel? Absolutely. I'm going to come to a parallel method. OK? Yes, very good point. Um, but I'll, I'll get there in a moment, so bear with me. Um, just to remind you about bias and variance, in case your probability is a little rusty, well, probably you all know this very well, but let me just illustrate what happens in the case of sampling algorithm. If we say that a, a sampling algorithm has low bias and low variance for calculating an average, that would, that would correspond to this picture here. We're right on the target, okay? So all the samples are right on the target, and they're tightly bound. Um, on the other hand, if we had low bias and high variance, they'd be spread more widely, but still centered on the target. So the bias is, is, is low here, but uh, the variance is high. Um, and this is a high bias, low variance case, and high bias, high variance. You can get any of these in these sampling algorithms. So that's one of the things you have to think about. Another thing you have to think about is sort of quantifying the performance of algorithms. And I already mentioned earlier this integrated autocorrelation time, which is a very useful thing for analyzing the convergence 
of algorithms uh, in, this, in this class. Um, these are some things based on variance, some, some quantifiers based on variance that are useful. Uh, so one is the effective sample size, which uh, just uses the fact that if we had AID samples, we would know exactly how the variance of this sum would, uh, would, would, would reduce with the number of samples. Um, if, this, if the individual samples were perfectly correlated, meaning they were all identical, then we know that the variance of, of, this, uh, of this sum is constant. So somehow we have a lower number of different samples. And what this effective sample size does is it tells us sort of how many samples, independent samples, our calculation corresponds to. Um, another very useful quantifier is the asymptotic variance, which was actually mentioned in the last talks. Statisticians are quite fond of this one. So if you look at the expectation, this is the squared error in expectation of an observable uh, at step n. Then you have, um, you can break this up into two parts. So this is the squared bias. So that's something that won't go away, right, as we take more samples. And the, uh, the variance uh, uh, of, of phi hat n. So this is sometimes called the asymptotic variance. That will go down with n. But how it goes down with n is important. OK, so now I'm going to describe a class of methods that um, is a little bit different than the schemes that we've been talking about. These are based on uh, solving stochastic differential equations. And I, I appreciate that people don't ha maybe have a huge background in differential equations or stochastic differential equations. So I'm going to do this in a very light way, but I'm going to try and point you to some ideas and, and to literature that would be useful. So, uh, so we want to determine this integral uh, where we're given this, uh, this, this probability measure. So we know we can compute the density, for the e, you know, e to the minus u. We can compute uh, u and its gradient as well. And uh, a stochastic differential equation is like an ordinary differential equation, but it includes something called a, a Wiener increment. And this is, uh, this is in the context of, of Ito integration. So this is the sort of framework for this. But you could... Sorry? Say it again. Why is there a two? There just is. Okay, so that it will do the right thing. It somehow got to be there. Okay, um, it's something to do with Fokker Planck equations, but I'm not going to explain it. Okay, there just is a two there, it has to be there. So, uh, this will, if you wanted to sample this distribution, there has to be a two there. Um, so, the if you take the, the time average of the solutions to the stochastic differential equation, so think of it as an ODE but having some sort of random process built in. Then you take the time average, right? So this is the average in time. It will converge to the average that you're interested in, the integral. Okay, so there's a way of sneaking up on it by defining solutions of stochastic differential equations. And then all we need is a way of computing these uh, solutions to the SDE. So we need a numerical method. So another way to write the Stochastic differential equation, perhaps uh, more familiar to some people, would be like this. So I just write q dot equal f of q, that's like an ODE. And then I have uh, square root of 2 times eta of t, this is a Gaussian process. Okay, so this is a, a way to think about it. Uh, in fact, um, it's better to think about it in terms of the numerical method itself that you would use. So what you have there is a map like this, a stochastic map. H is playing the role of epsilon, which I mentioned before, that parameter that can be made small, and Rn is a, is a Gaussian random variable. So we map Q0 to Q1 and so on up to Qn, okay, through this, and we can keep going as long as we want. Um, and the step size here, h, is a small parameter. So with a smaller value of h, we get a higher accuracy, um, which means a lower bias. But we also have higher correlation between the steps. Now, um, you actually have to consider another family of SDEs in practice, and this is very similar to what we did with the HMC. You embed this into the context of having a mass and a momentum in your system. So you kind of artificially 
increase the space by adding more variables. These correspond to momenta. It turns out that using the momentum is very, you know, this allows you to explore uh, more freely the, uh, the, the, the space, especially in, in cases where you have these entropic barriers, like you can think of them as sort of narrow tunnels or, or uh, um, you know, valleys in the, in the, the landscape. And uh, so uh, Brownian uh, first-order dynamics, the one that I mentioned earlier, that stochastic differential equation, that's non-inertial, but including mass can help you to explore better. And you can see in this very simple problem where the energy is always zero, we have these walls. So we bounce around in here, we're taking Brownian paths. If we start into this channel, we'll typically turn around before we'll get very far. But if we have mass, this is in the first order dynamics, if we have mass, then we can get carried through. So we can make excursions between the two basins. It's a very simple example, but somehow illustrative. Um, so this is the launch of N dynamics. This is the setting for doing these, these uh, uh, SDEs with, uh, with the momenta included. Now, uh, you can show that these SDEs preserve this distribution, which in fact came up before in the context of HMC schemes. And uh, what we have here is a, is a relatively simple dissipated stochastic perturbation applied to Newton's equations. Okay, so the way we integrate them is again by splitting. I described splitting methods for Hamiltonian systems. This is a splitting method for the stochastic differential equation. And the only difference is that when I do the stochastic part, and I want to write the solution to it, I have to solve that in the sense of distributions. Okay, so this is the formula for a map which samples the correct distribution. So this one, I've labeled these pieces A, B, and O, and I call this method ABO. And of course, you could get other methods by putting the pieces together in different orders, and it turns out that it's actually very important which order you take. So you could have the OBA, OAB, Aboba, Obabo, you can make up your own methods of this form. When I write them symmetrically like this, I mean I take a half step with A here and a half step with A here and so on. So it's symmetric. And then you can analyze and compare the resulting uh, stochastic maps and their iterations. Now, this is where there's a big jump because I'm not going to go through the mathematical analysis of this because that is a bit complicated. But, and we don't have time for it, but I would say that everything is based on this thing, which is called the Fokker-Planck equation, which underpins stochastic differential equations. And the solution here is the density at time t. And this is for the SDEs themselves, for Langevin dynamics. And what I'm going to show you is um, what happens if I start uh, with a delta distribution at zero, or something approximating that, and I look at what happens over time. So I put that into this, this partial differential equation for the evolving distribution. And you can see, hopefully, did you do, yes, oh, sorry about that, I broke it there. So you can see it starts like that, and then you get actually probability sloshing about. It's sort of funny because it's a bit like a fluid model, right? But this is, this is gotten by solving 100,000 simulations forward and using a histogram. And you can see also that it settles down eventually to a distribution, which is in fact the right distribution almost, okay? I've used a numerical method to do this, the Bayov method. So this is, a, this is settling to a slightly wrong distribution. And every one of those numerical methods will settle to a different slightly wrong distribution. So this is sort of showing that in, in time you're converging to something. This is the distribution. Well, it turns out, and I'm just going to you know, show you this example, and uh, you know, I don't have time to go through analysis of this, but I think it's quite a cool thing. Um, if you take that STE, you have an invariant measure associated to it. You can discretize the STE, and you have an invariant measure associated to that. That's that long-term steady state. And this depends on the step size, right? Because it's for a numerical method. And the perturbation here can be quantified, and it turns out that uh, you know, you can write down a formula for it, okay? So for different SD numerical methods. Now, if you take the Obabo method, and you take the gamma parameter in the Langevin dynamics to infinity, which means high friction limit, 
you get the Euler-Mariama method. And you can analyze this method, and so you can analyze this one, and you can say that this is a first-order method for the invariant distribution. By contrast, if you take the Beowald method and go to the high friction limit, you get a different numerical method. And that's the method that's written here. So it looks like the Euler-Mariama method. The only difference is we have two Gaussian random variables here, but they're correlated from step to step. And they're correlated from step to step in just the right way so that this is a second order method for the invariant distribution. So that's the kind of stuff you can do by looking at the Fokker Planck equation. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just show you that this really works out in practice. And uh, this is an uneven double well model, a bimodal distribution, you know, that you have associated to that. And, um, and now this is the euler mariama method at small step size, at large step size. And this is the, the method that I just described, the limit of that Bayaud method, at small step size and large step size. And you can see that at the large step size, for example, this has completely lost the plot. But the other method is, is accurate, but it's also, you know, it's accurate at both the large and small uh, steps here. Okay, um, I'm just, I've got a few slides about improving convergence. And I'm just going to go very briefly through this. Is that uh, all right, Jared? Do I have time to Slip through these, about uh, four minutes. Okay, uh, so, um, you know, HMC and Longevin dynamics methods are typically ergodic and usually far better than, say, random walk MC. But there are many situations where they get stuck near local minima. And so the idea is to try to improve the convergence and make more rapid convergence. And we're going to do that using a parallel computing method. So this will go a bit fast. This is new work, but it's a nice case study to illustrate what you might be able to do. So the motivating example is if you have a, a system like this, say you could you can imagine it's just a, a two by two matrix here, sigma, so this is a harmonic problem, but you have an elongated basin like that. Then it turns out that MCMC schemes, like Euler Mariyama or the other method that I mentioned, um, have a stability criterion that limits your step size to about a big O of lambda min, the smaller eigenvalue of this matrix sigma. So what's happening is that you're sort of being stuck rattling around in these ends, and it takes you a long time to sample the distribution. Now for a linear problem, we can rescale the distribution so that we sample more efficiently the, the, full, the full region. So if we could sort of squish this, stretch this out to a, to a disk, we could sample it. Um, so the idea is to do a rescaling, but we have to do a rescaling that's going to work for more complicated distribution functions. And uh, so there are a number of different approaches here. This is related to an optimization, like the BFGS method and stochastic Newton schemes. They try to build this local covariance approximation on the fly. And we're going to do something along those lines. And it's also related to the Riemannian manifold uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method of Girolami. So the idea is an ensemble precondition, we're gonna use a family of walkers, so that's the parallel computing bit, and we're going to distribute them around our system, and we want them to explore the different um, minima in the landscape. And then we're going to build local covariance approximations from the collection of walkers. And that means that each walker sees a slightly warped version of the system, which corresponds to its current state. Um, so the basic idea is that you build up your collection of walkers, and uh, you have a, you, one of the key things is that you use a product of the target distribution. So the density that you're sampling is the target distribution just in product form. Um, and that's the, I'm not gonna go through the details of that, but that's using a you know, weighted covariance and a number of tricks to make this method effective um, by you know, eliminating problems of multiplicative noise and implicitness, which would otherwise um, show up in, in integrating these equations. So this is actually fairly easy to integrate the system up here, um, you know, despite the complexity of, of the appearance uh, there, um, and use uh, something very similar to the Beowab method that I mentioned. Okay, so, uh, so for the Gaussian mixture model, I just have uh, one comparison. I'll do this, this uh, Hidalgo stamps model. And uh, just to note that in this problem, if you look at the scaling, you have poor scaling 
in each individual basin, but the picture is different for the different basins. So you need a local covariance in this problem. You need to do something differently depending on where you are in space. And uh, so uh, we use this uh, weighted covariance-based dynamical sampler with multiple walkers. And this is just showing the integrated autocorrelation times for different quantities that you could compute in comparison between Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, Langevin dynamics, and ensemble quasi-Newton. That's our new method. So what you're seeing is that you can dramatically reduce the integrated autocorrelation time. When we do these ones, because we're working with a parallel strategy here, we just copy the system and we have independent replicas of the same number, okay, to make a fair comparison. But these are not parallel methods. This is a parallel method. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the last uh, bit, and I'll just uh, conclude here. Um, sampling iterations can be constructed in many ways. Okay, they can be designed to be unbiased, or you could have controllable bias, meaning that you control the, the bias with a small parameter. Um, the pr precise way that you're going to get to equilibrium will depend you know, very much on the details of the construction of the methods that you're using and the features of the problem. So in most cases, you actually need to build bespoke methods. You'll need to actually do something that is a bit customized to the problems at hand. And that's actually an issue for machine learning. We need to look at the landscapes and understand something about the structures of these landscapes that appear there. It's only partially understood at this point. And uh, finally, I've mentioned that we can use walkers to try to accelerate the convergence and, to, and improve the rate. Um, I have uh, references here, quite a variety of things, starting from an introductory course on statistical mechanics, which starts, by the way, today on Coursera. Highly recommended if you don't know any statistical mechanics and you want to learn something about this. Um, and then uh, there's something about convergence of Monte Carlo methods, um, about the Metropolis uh, Hastings, me Hastings method, um, using MCMC and machine learning applications, the Mine and Tweedy book that I mentioned, um, Jonathan Goodman's ACOR package and his notes on Monte Carlo methods, everything, anything Jonathan Goodman writes is really readable, very useful. Monte Carlo methods in statistics, this is the genius that's behind a lot of the ideas coming in in Monte Carlo methods over the past 50 years, really, I would say. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. Um, Radford Neal's wonderful introduction to Hamiltonian, sorry, that's, yeah, to, to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods. Um, this is so readable, so easy to, to follow. I've used that in preparing these, these slides. And then I have a book on simulating Hamiltonian dynamics, which tells how to build symplectic integrators. Um, das Heim has written a nice review article on stochastic differential equations and the numerical solution. Here's something on SDs more detailed. This is, has numerics and SD foundations. We have a recent book on the Langevin dynamics techniques, that's molecular dynamics uh, from Springer. And finally, the article that I mentioned. So thank you for your attention.